If you like our podcast, we think you'll love our Next Economy MBA. It's a nine-month learning journey for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and aspiring change makers alike. Our MBA gives emerging leaders a new set of blueprints for creating life-serving, regenerative organizations. We explore topics like regenerative finance, cooperative models of ownership, alternative economics, and much more. You'll leave inspired by the stories of leading Next Economy organizations, and you'll be nourished by a community of mission-aligned peers. So we invite you to join our flourishing community of more than 275 alumni and growing. Visit lifteconomy.com slash MBA to learn more. That's L-I-F-T economy dot com slash MBA to learn more. Cohort 8, our newest cohort, starts on March 29th, 2022. If you like our podcast, we think you'll love our Next Economy MBA. It's a nine-month learning journey for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs, and aspiring change makers alike. Our MBA gives emerging leaders a new set of blueprints for creating life-serving, regenerative organizations. We explore topics like regenerative finance, cooperative models of ownership, alternative economics, and much more. You'll leave inspired by the stories of leading Next Economy organizations. And you'll be nourished by a community of mission-aligned peers. So we invite you to join our flourishing community of more than 275 alumni and growing. Visit lifteconomy.com slash MBA to learn more. That's L-I-F-T economy dot com slash MBA to learn more. Cohort 8, our newest cohort, starts on March 29th, 2022. Welcome to Next Economy Now. The goal of this podcast series is to highlight the leaders who are taking a regenerative, bioregional, equitable, democratic, racially just, and whole systems approach to creating the new economy. Canyon Sayers Roots, we are so grateful that you're joining us today on Next Economy Now. Welcome to the show. Mishmin Tuhis, I'm really happy and glad to join this conversation. Thank you. I'd love it if you would start by introducing yourself to our listeners. What is your story and how did you get involved in this movement? <laughs> Connor Akat, Canyon Coyote Woman Sayers Roots. <laughs> I identify as a California native. I come from Indian Canyon Nation. My mother is tribal chairwoman Anne-Marie Sayers of the Indian Canyon Mutsun Band of Coast Tanoan Ohlone people. And having been raised in Indian Canyon, I have the privilege and honor of being raised on the land of my grandmother's 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 grandmother. And as my mother and my grandmother have shared since time immemorial. That being said, uh, as an up-and-coming leader and activist and ancestor in training, uh, a lot of this work has been a lifelong expectation as well as commitment. So I've kind of been been in the forefront of a handful of things and then followed amazing trailblazers and leaders and motivational speakers, as well as those who are holding culture close to their heart and honoring truth and history. So yeah, as a California Native woman fighting for the rights of nature honoring truth and history around recognizing that we are on occupied Native land and being an up-and-coming leader of our own governing community. Uh, There's a lot that I've stepped into that I have a lot of connection to responsibility and a value, generally a commitment (laughs) that I need to uphold. (laughs) Well, I can't wait for our listeners to learn more from from all that you've um, been absorbing and and, uh, practicing. And I love how you put it, ancestor in training. I'm curious if you could share some of that um, training with our listeners, because I think there's a lot of um, wisdom that you hold around caring for our home in the, in the modern age. Um, maybe, maybe let's start there. Well, I would love to introduce myself as the CEO and founder of Canyon Consulting, a consultation LLC that just became incorporated in 2018. So starting this new year in a good way. And that being said, I offer indigenous insight intensives as well as cultural competence 
cultural competency trainings. To be a good ancestor in training is to recognize that we have a deep responsibility. Many times when I or my mother will visit classrooms, we will inform even third graders, fourth graders, that at some point in their life, they will be in a position of making decisions and they need and they need to understand that it's important that they need to consider the impact of those decisions, that impact to not only their family or their community, also to their kin, the plants and the animals, their environment, as well as the next generations, that they should consider that the decision they make has a deep impact, that our actions and our words will affect those around us and those coming after us. And sometimes that really does mean saying no to the quick investment at the quarter end dividend. It means considering all aspects. So when we think about, um, let's say something simple. Let's say we, someone has a business where they bottle a new green lotion. They may like to say, oh, this causes no harm to women's bodies, i.e. the lotion doesn't hurt someone's skin. But what does it really mean to have a deep investment in a no harm to women's bodies uh, through the entire creation of that entire product, meaning not just the lotion, the actual chemical concoction, but the bottling process or the marketing process or where the items and ingredients come from. The entire process needs to be harm-free to women if you are going to claim that commitment. And sometimes that means uh, struggling in a system that tends to not always care about the value of humanity or our relations our kin, the animals and the plants. So that that's kind of along the lines of what I bring to conversations, especially cultural competency trainings, uh, to talk about what it means to be on occupied native land, to honor what we call indigenous protocol. Indigenous protocol is something that has transpired since humanity began, when people started grouping together and calling a space their home. Whenever Today, people follow an etiquette of, I ask little kids, I say, what do we do when we want to borrow a cup of sugar? Do we walk right into someone's kitchen and take it? Or is there some sort of etiquette or practice that we, we follow? And I, 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 the kids are like, no, we don't walk in and take it. Or some, some like to joke and say yes. And then I'll knock on the wall or I'll knock on a hard surface. And people go, knock on the door, ask permission. And I will, I will voice them, yes, consent culture is key. If you are not on the home of your ancestors who have always been here, then you are a visitor. And seeking permission from the original peoples, the original caretakers, the original stewards of the land is an important part of being in relation to the land. And following indigenous protocol is becoming familiar with that knowledge. Now, other countries have raised awareness of this, like, let's say, Canada or even Australia. Australia has a protocol of practice called Welcome to Country, where the Aboriginal Indigenous peoples We'll welcome people to country saying, all right, you're acknowledging the land, you're acknowledging the communities on the land, and you're recognizing that you are a visitor. Now, here in the United States, Western settler colonialism has impacted us, and many historians and information made available to us have been misinterpreted, whitewashed, um, diluted, degraded, and honoring truth in history is not even a priority of people. And that's very problematic. It's problematic, not just because Native people should be acknowledged for being here and present, but when it comes to land stewardship, responsibility to land, Native peoples don't own the land. They are caretakers. They're in relationship with, which means we tend and steward these spaces in a good way. We have a reciprocal relationship with these living systems. We will offer offerings of songs and medicine to the plants when we harvest them. We engage in ethical sustainable harvesting practices. We don't do this clear cutting. We don't do this monolithic agriculture or livestock. And being in relation to honoring these life systems is a necessity, is a part of life. And the same thing when it comes to land management, indigenous peoples all around the world use fire. And today we have Smokey the Bear saying fire is bad, fire is bad. And all these scary stories about could cause fire, could cause fire. And we don't have a good relationship with fire yet when we think about sudden oak death and the disease that is running rampant within these oak trees, it is because our lack of land management practices where fire would have been used. Now we have governments and state agencies saying, let's preserve the land, let's conserve the land, let's put a fence around it and leave it wild. These wildfires are bad and we need to put a fence around it and leave it wild. And it's like, 
we have forcefully divorced humans' relationship to the land and the stewardship practices, of which has created the detriment that we are currently in. With these huge fires, because we've created these tender boxes, we don't have a relationship with the land, we don't listen to it, we don't talk to it, we don't respect it. And that is something that we can yield insight from indigenous communities everywhere around the world. And that's something that I just bring to the forefront. So uh, that's mm-hmm. just a tip of the iceberg. <laughs> mm, beautiful. Well, congratulations on launching your consulting company, Canyon. We're um, really, really excited to hear more about that. And our listeners will, will be familiar um, with some of the what we're talking about just because we've had Karina Gold on. We've also had um, Val Lopez from Amamutsen on talking about, you know, fire tending and fire management and, um, and, and also, um, the original instructions, you know, how to, how to ask permission. And, and I, I'm grateful for you reminding our listeners of that. And I'm, I'm really curious because I know you did just host a big work day out at Indian Canyon, actually this past weekend. And I'm wondering if you could share any insights with our listeners around maybe bring them in, show them a picture of what it looked like, how, how, um, you know, non-natives and natives work together and, and kind of what, what happened this weekend. I wish I could have been there. So I'm, I'm selfishly asking on my behalf too. (laughs) It was a beautiful weekend. Uh, we, we also opened up the Friday and the Sunday after. So people who had to travel long distances were able to camp out and ground themselves so they could wake up rested and engage. And it was beautiful because, we we knew we were walking into a this conversation of California ecological restoration camp procedure as new community members. So the assessment of the land, as well as assessing the community of uh, what community we have, the skills that they have, to ensure that we can align align people with the various tasks that the the local land community needed. And so we we chose to invite Sudden Oak Life. Dot org um, community members to offer a presentation. So there was a, an incentive for the community to come learn from the presentation and possibly even apply their skills. And so that was the dominant uh, conversation where a beautiful presentation was shared about restoring oaks using utilizing fire mimicry skills. Even even before that presentation, we grounded ourselves in ceremony and, and acknowledging who is part of the conversation. So we went up to the waterfall. We passed one waterfall and went up to the second one. And we had a small circle where we acknowledged the land. We acknowledged the community. We recognized that we are visitors and we, we humble ourselves in, in, in being invited in this space. And then I offered a, a song. And then I asked everyone to to share where they came from and, and possibly how they were feeling. Sometimes it's a great way to ground ourselves to say where, where we come from. And, and sometimes people are like, wait, you want me to know where I came from like yesterday or like maybe my ancestors? And I say, whatever you feel comfortable with as well as whatever you know. Some people will say, well, I reside in Huchin, uh, currently known as Oakland, and my ancestry come from over here, over there, and over here. I loosely identify with this. I'm still learning this, this, this. And it's a beautiful way to ground ourselves. And therefore, some people start to learn, oh, it's, it's applicable in any way. If I don't know my ancestors, I can acknowledge the native peoples of the land we are currently on. Uh, and, and it's just a, a beautiful way to get a sense of who's, who's present. And... Um, we started talking about all of the needs of the community from simple needs of water infrastructure, uh, stream restoration, as well as fire prevention. So, you know, cleaning up branches and leaves, but also protecting some of the oak trees. After we learn from that presentation of Sudden Oak Life, we are able to look at oak trees a little differently, like finding out, because uh, the instructor or the, the, the educator said, let's go out and talk and listen to the trees and, and find out um, how we may or may not be able to apply some of the knowledge we are learning. And the beautiful part is we got to show a oak tree that had already been worked on by Lee Klinger, the organizer of Sudden Oak Life, and uh, show how have a conversation, like be able to visit it after a few weeks. So it was really wonderful to already see some of the, the steps taken um, to to work with the oak tree. And then all of the uh, community members are like, okay, um, how can we approach and talk about these trees? So we wandered around and found some oak trees um, that were a little ill or some of them that might be susceptible. And so 
mimicking fire was amazing from from uh, limiting the lichen in the moss to a little burn, uh, burning of the bark to strengthen it, offering various minerals and calcium and azomite and a few other things. I was really impressed in the, the instructor's ability to, to share. I really appreciate they centered it in indigenous knowledge and, and practices of listen to the land. Just because we learn these things, just because we took a permaculture design course or an e ecological study or a survey, doesn't mean we should just go right to some place, start assessing and saying, well, this is what this area needs. It's a process and it means establishing relation. And so I really appreciated that conversation being grounded with that focal point. And so from going from there, we also talked up and down the canyon, talking about edible plants and medicinal plants, the elderberries, the mugwort, the black sage, the purple sage, the white sage, and, and other, uh, the laurel bay, the edible nuts, the acorns, acorn processing, showing our small, um, tiny little cultural display, our ethno-botanical cultural display, and how that, that building needs infrastructure assistance, and, and, and how we educate students all the time, but we also need a little help and how many community members we serve annually in excess of 6,000 and um, how we do it on a dominantly shoestring budget. We, we have our nonprofit, but it's grassroots and we are not a park. We're not a federally funded agency. This is literally the kindness of a woman who opened her land in the efforts of giving opportunities for indigenous people in need of land for ceremony. And along those lines, also opening it up for educational purposes. And I aim to continue in honoring that legacy. And so me stepping into talking about plants and educating and also asking, hey, there are things that I don't know. There might be more efficient or, or strategic approaches to, to help the canyon. And I would love help. And I, so I'm always willing to collaborate and network and seek community members who may know from sustainable living systems, off the grid living systems, to um, providing community based efforts, like even just like community guidelines, because I'm looking up like hybrid woofer agreements, because if we have people who come to stay for a little while, we want to make sure one they know that they're on their own when it comes to um, <laughs> safety, <laughs> but uh, other other things of just like the serious policies and procedures. I I know I'm new to this more practical 21st century application of how businesses are run. At the same time, I bring the cultural value of indigenous pedagogies and indigenous wisdom keeper um, sense of responsibility to land management and connection to these living systems. So I'm trying to step between worlds of cultural knowledge and cultural revitalization, as well as 21st century business management and, and finding sustainable sources and assistance and agreements and all that fun stuff. So I had lovely conversations with community members. It was beautiful. Um, and so we, we started working on the land. Some community members started cleaning out the ponds. So the water storage was increased, um, thinning out various invasive plant species to ensure that the local uh, um, indigenous plants had room and space to, to uh, have an opportunity. I, I shared a story back when San Francisco State University visited uh, the canyon. They cleared part of the pond out and we have an invasive patch of vinca, this, this little ivy, this rhizome. And when we cleared it up, no more than a week later, these little, little plants started popping up and they grew really tall, almost taller than me. And they had little uh, trumpet-like flowers, some of them white, almost yellow. And their leaves were sticky. And I was like, what are these? I have no, I've never seen these. I learned that they were tobacco, wild California tobacco. I'm sitting here like, wait a second, these were here? And it, a lot of California indigenous plants will go dormant until the right opportunity arises. And sometimes that means we need to steward and tend the land for those opportunities. We have a responsibility to it. And so I, I shared them that story. And so a few of them were kind of inspired. They're like, all right, let's, let's go help that part of the pond. And, and then we also have a healing pole that needs to be uh, restored. So we have hashtag a healing pole restoration project. We have another project that I need help with, hashtag Team Tiny Home. My elder uh, uncle, who's disabled, is in a not-so-safe environment in a 
RV that's not the healthiest. And so I'm trying to find a way to build a tiny home uh, on Indian country. So, hey, for those who have um, knowledge, we are not subject to city, county, or state regulation because we are on Indian country. And so uh, I wouldn't mind any insight on off-the-grid, sustainable, fully, uh, you know, fully encompassed um, <laughs> so living system. And so uh, we're just haphazardly approaching it and taking it on because something needs to happen. And instead of waiting for the right conditions, the right amount of money, the right anything, we just started. So we, we, ha we just have the floor right now. <laughs> Love so, it. Love yeah. it. Yeah, I want to get it built now. <laughs> This is very, uh, Lifty County, we were just at a Buckminster Fuller Institute event, and all, all that you're speaking about is so Buckminster Fuller of you and in terms of just doing what needs to be done, uh, forging pathways and partnerships to work together to reclaim uh, livelihoods and lifeways that are uh, more in line with, with ecosystems and bioregions and living lightly um, in, in, in tandem with ecosystem processes. So, um, I am so curious about, you've done so much education, so much teaching, your songs have graced so many events, um, you've been called on to kind of uh, give the introductions at many, many events um, in, 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 in honoring uh, right relation with, with the indigenous tribes whose stolen land we, we inhabit. Um, I'm curious if there were like a moment or how you moved from this how you moved into recognizing that there was possibly a demand for your consulting and that there was really um, kind of, it was clear to you that you needed to kind of become more formal in your consulting approach. Could you share maybe that story a little bit? Definitely. It, um, so fundamentally when it comes to acknowledging the land and maybe people inviting my mother or myself to an event, that's a sharing of culture and sometimes that's a blessing or or a connection to culture and it's not always the easiest thing or the safest thing to to charge for like when people say what's your performance fee what do you charge and it's like really it feels spiritually grungy to say oh i charge this much for me to come to a space to either bless or honor acknowledge ancestors of the land that's a culture sharing opportunity that yes is invaluable it's priceless um, most definitely people need to consider time and travel, wear and tear on vehicles, wear and tear on human beings. But when it comes to today's cultural economy, we are really focused in this capitalistic society and we need to step away from that. And so when I tell people, it is actually up to the individual who's seeking the culture, cultural representative, the indigenous cultural representative should be invited by the community member and the offer should be made um, by the person who's inviting. I make a romanticized version of saying, okay, if we have a medicine person of the indigenous community who, who's doing the work to help the community, you have a family member or your child who needs care, you seek out this medicine person, this medicine person is probably not going to say, oh, I won't help your child unless you give me this much. The the connection is that person will probably do what they can to help you. And then as, as your child is probably getting better or everything that's done is, is possible, the value of that interaction is on the person who sought out that. And that you, at that window of time, you would probably offer what you could. You'd offer what your child's life is worth to you. And that probably is going to be as much as you can. As much as you can, because of course you still need to sustain yourself. At the same time, you also respect the knowledge and the help and the care that was given. So therefore, you would offer as much as you can. And so I bring that into modern day context saying, offer as much as you can afford. If you can pull it off, tap into your budget and give truly as much as you can afford because this work is ongoing. Majority of the people who hold this space are not being advantageous or they're not even hoarding these resources. Most of the time, these resources go back and empower community members. So therefore, I realize every time a new person says, can you come and offer land acknowledgements? Can you come and offer a prayer? Can you come and open and bless this place? And then they're like, how much do you charge? I'm sitting here like, I feel gross every time I have to give a number. At the same time, I still need to consider myself, my time, my efforts. And then in it, we are establishing relation. We are establishing connections. So therefore, this knowledge I'm sharing, these intellectual property rights of my own, as well as my community and culture are invaluable. At the same time, considering that this is true work. So 
if I create a workshop or if I create a lecture series or um, a speaking opportunity and also empowering other community members, I need some sort of 21st century mechanism to operate in this world. So I'm, I co-founded it with my partner, Scott, Scott Torito, who uh, has what, in excess of 30 years experience in the mortgage industry, realized that he was selling his soul and, and, and had no connection to life and, and passion of, of that kind of existence. And once he met me and started realizing a deep disservice was, has been done to every, everyone in the education system, <laughs> all of these students, even when he was in third, fourth, fifth grade, he was told lies. And what does that mean to have a systemic approach to teach the teachers, to, to engage the educators and anyone in position of activating or interacting with the public coming across when it comes to messaging, just simple messaging, like let's say state parks or historians or teachers, when they say the Ohlone people were here, they used to live like this. And then when the teacher's like, do, do you know any Ohlone people now? Or do you know if they're here? And most of the kids say, no. And it's because we use those words, past tense. Mm. And just because just because we don't see community members, yes, there's not that many of us, does not mean we don't exist. And so your messaging comes across mm -hmm. and you need to be culturally competent to be talking about indigenous peoples. I've been constantly saying nothing about us without us. If you're going to write a paper, if you're going to talk about us, if we're not part of your conversation, if we're not consulted or involved in some form, you're doing a deep disservice and mm -hmm. you shouldn't be engaged on it like it's okay to talk about your own personal experience be accountable by saying i met california natives and i heard them talk about x and i heard them talk about y versus i know california natives feel this way and i know this 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 instead of saying that be accountable just say in my communal connections with these people and this community i have learned this mm -hmm. i don't know how to talk about these issues because i don't live this world as that community member though what i have learned is a b and c just that humility and that confidence in being able to say, I, because many times people say, oh, we feel this way, or those people don't like that. It's like, who are you to say? You don't have a right to say it. Even though you may have heard it, maybe only one person like I, Canyon Sarah's Roots, happen to not like um, the word American Indian. At the same time, I have been called American Indian, and I have um, realize we do need to use it because government contracts and treaties use those forms of words. So if we immediately try to politically correct everything, we'd actually be shooting ourselves in the foot and in, in saying, oh, guess what? Those, those contracts, those treaties are null and void because there's no more American Indians. <laughs> and I realize that. But um, when someone hears me say, I don't like American Indian, they might say, oh, you people don't like that. And then they go to another native person saying, don't you, you don't like that, right? And instead of saying, may I ask how you identify? I'm curious uh, what you may prefer. How, how may I be um, respectful in, in voicing how, 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 how you want to be identified? Like, same thing with gender pronouns, consent culture. That person over there has a really cool sweater. And until they tell me who they are, or if I describe them, I may say that female-bodied person. But until they tell me they identify with he, she, they, them, other, I will continue to say they, and it's simple. <laughs> and, yeah. and so when it comes to just messaging, just respect and consent culture and accountability, because even to this day, there are archaeologists and historians who say nobody lived in the Bay Area up until 5,000 years ago, and the Ohlone people came here. And it's like, mm -hmm. wait a second. And they wrote it with confidence, and they wrote it back in the 80s saying 5,000 years ago is when people came here, and they said mm -hmm. it as a matter of fact. But oh wait, the same archaeologists um, next generation have carbon dated that the oldest archaeological sensitive site in the Bay Area is 9,800 years. Wait a second. What? The, I just saw that museum curated bit of work that said 5,000 years. And they mm -hmm. said it with confidence. And they're informing the public. Wait, there's, there's a lot of misinformation going on. And it's when people feel confident about something. And so to this day, people are like, you guys came across the Bering Strait. And I'm like, there are many human beings that happen to cross both directions along the Bering Strait. There is also such a thing as the Kelp Highway when it comes to watercraft, tule craft. There are many community members that would travel. Vikings even visited California before the missions were here. So when people come at me trying to say, well, science says this and science says that, it's like, you do realize a long time ago, science said the earth was flat. And then science, 
the earth was round and here we go again where science and community members are again saying the world is flat again. And I'm sitting here like, just be calm and humble in your observations of what we know as fact. And when modern day science is catching up, like, like new studies says DNA has genetic memory. People's organs that were donated still have some of the habits of their previous creator. Oh, gee, Native people have been saying blood memory since time immemorial, and many scientists and colonizers deny that, and yet science is catching up, and then people validate it. And it's, it's flustering because it's settler colonialism denying community members. We, we've been brought up in this primitive light, this, this hunter-gatherer, and we've been denied that our legitimate indigenous sciences, our indigenous technology exists and thrives and mm-hmm. is constantly dismissed. Mm-hmm. And it's frustrating because it's settler colonial entitlement denying the existence that other people, other nations, other community members are amazing, competent individuals. And that settler colonialism, these narratives of oppression should just calm themselves, humble themselves and be accountable and I, 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 long time ago, I, I will own up. As a youth, I used to say white people, but I would always say right after that sentence, I don't like, I, I don't like, I don't like white people in this behavior. When I say white, I don't mean pigmentation of their skin. I mean their mind. Mm. And mm-hmm. really negligent of the sacred. It's capitalistic. It's consumeristic. It's privilege. It's negligent. And and then I started realizing, you know what? People start getting triggered by that word when I say white people. That's okay. Mm. That's okay. Well. Canon, could could I ask a question about that? Because I, I think that you know, Lyft Economy has been leaning into talking and being more um, above board around this idea of the need to dismantle white supremacy. And yeah, I I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Just anything that comes up, and how, especially from this perspective of how how to kind of share the the emotional burden and the workload across kind of all of us who inhabit these spaces rather than just having it be kind of centering on, you know, those who focus on social justice work or those who focus on um, anti-oppression work, but how, how we actually all kind of collectively show up to that work of dismantling white supremacy. Um, well, along the thread of my previous statement, when I owned up saying white, I then started shifting my words and saying Western settler colonialism or the Western settler mentality. Um, it's a Eurocentric and Americentric uh, foundation. And then um, start pointing out the behaviors. Because when we start accusing people, any, any psychologist might say, like, it, it's not, it could be problematic pointing out that someone is bad or someone is this. Like, when you say distinct statements versus this behavior is bad, the, this type of habit or this action is bad, because those things can be corrected. Those things can be accountable for. Mm-hmm. And, and humbling ourselves in that accountability is one healthy step. And so when we start dismantling it, one, we need to acknowledge that we are currently all affected by colonization and all of us are at our various stages of healing. Some of us may not be taking many steps to heal because we may be unfamiliar with it, let alone don't even know how to account for it. And then some of us who are healing may uh, be growing fast or slowly. So some of us are learning. So that's where some of, when I see some of my native relations who are perpetuating some of those historical traumatic um, lessons learned, as well as when you think about uh, Native American post-colonial psychology, the psyche of the oppressed take on the characteristics of the oppressor. That happens in many circles. So sometimes we end up repeating these patterns that have been done onto us because that's what we have witnessed and that's what has been effective to impacting our life and also possibly uh, yielded results in impacting other people's lives. So do on to others kind of thing in the not so healthiest fashion. Mm -hmm. Um, In doing this work, we need to recognize that even though, let's say like someone who's new, like learns about uh, decolonization work and, 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 and this type of stuff, sometimes we jump on board of these things and then do this holier than thou approach of like, I'm more decolonized than you. And it's unhealthy. And Mm -hmm. when, when you, when you, when you, you step into that more superior than, sometimes that replicates the models of oppression that systemically have marginalized community members in the first place with gentrification, with colonization of native peoples, let's say with the missions Mm -hmm. outsiders coming in saying they know better saying that the current community is ignorant and that um, the the approaches that these new community members have are better. So therefore 
you silence, you disenfranchise, and you hinder the original community. Now that, that, that can be repeated with decolonizers coming in saying, you're not decolonized, we can do this better. What, what I really loved hearing you say, if I could just um, kind of build on it for the listeners, it sounded like, you know, moving from just being inundated with requests to come and speak and do intros, moving it from just doing kind of one-off introductions and prayer and ceremony to moving into more like the, the cultural work of actually helping to transform culture so that it's more reverent and more um, honoring of, of actual indigenous um, Californian history. Um, did, did I get yeah. capture that kind of correctly or is there anything else you'd like to elaborate Definitely. on? Definitely. Well, yeah, I, I want, I really do want to shift policy to, to, to encourage truth and history as a mandate, because if we start thinking about any organization, agency, institution who talks about going into, you know, the 21st century, uh, or talk about, you know, new innovative technology that's greener, better, healthier, um, more conscious, if, if all of these people are creating something and they don't even know the history of the land or the people, let alone possibly their own ancestors, how can any decision that they come to be properly informed? Because if you don't think about land management practices traditionally, if you don't think about seasonal winds, you don't think about respecting these life systems, you're coming in and you're making a change to an environment um, without investing in the local culture. And that, that's kind of like when we think about the various invasive species in Australia, the rats came off the ships, and then as a quick reactionary improvising answer, they said, hey, let's go get some reptiles. Let's go get some reptiles to kill the rodents. They bring reptiles without even investing in realizing that one is nocturnal and one is daylight. So now the indigenous species are deeply impacted by both two invasive species that were attempted to bring to, to be brought into the situation to solve one other problem and that's what happens when you have reactionary well-intended superficial not informed not invested and not integral decision making practices and I, I see these struggles all the time from all these you know like simple lawns lawns and rules and regulations that we can't have edible gardens providing food for our community and then when it comes to our little microcosm of how homelessness and prison industrial complex operates, indigenous communities did not have homelessness. Indigenous communities did not have prisons, yet we have a whole economy based on it, and we deny human existence as integral or responsible, like when we think of homeless peoples, like not everybody can fit into a mold of how people should operate. You go to work, you do this, you do that, you come home, you do this. You have your little car, you have your this, you have your that. It's like we need to break that societal norm and say there are many approachable models of how communities can live. And many times people are feeling denied access to community because they have been told all their life this is how life is when in all actuality there are indigenous communities around the world that operate totally differently, but there's this spiritual connection. There's this wellness that's beyond okay, I got food, shelter, yada, yada. Like there's this like unison of energy, this amazing occurrence of connection that a lot of people here, especially in America, are thirsty for, yet they don't even know the, the word or the definition of what they are thirsty for. Mm. And that's why, that's why consumerism and capitalism have enterprised off of it is like if you, if you make people unhappy, you tell them they're unhappy and you tell them that something will bring them happiness or, or you give them those little like, um, what is it, serotonin and dopamine bursts, hmm. um, you get that feel-good feeling. The same thing like when someone gets a job, they really need something. They either want to give their mom a, you know, a gift. They want to get a car for the first time. They want to give their family something. They want to pay off a bill that's stressing everybody. They get paid. They do their work. They feel good. It feels right. Sometimes it's usually a lot of altruism. A lot of altruistic gestures give you that happy little boost. But then people associate it with, oh, I made the money. And when I bought that, it felt good. And when I gave that, it felt good. But we, we then start unhealthy relationships in that capitalistic endeavor. And, and it's not, I'm not, I, I, I want to shift the way, um, I want to be of assistance to help educate the community so they can possibly have an extra perspective to approach the world and make various decisions that might help the world in the future. I know I can't change people. I know I can't change the world, but I would love to give people a perspective just to gnaw on, just to think about, to, to bring into their life and possibly apply it. 
Well, thank you, Kenyon. <laughs> we are right there with you. And uh, we always love to close our conversations with um, your sharing how people can reach you, how they can contact you, how they can learn from you, and, and any specific asks you have in terms of support that you like from those that are um, a lot right along there with you looking to build this next economy together. Ooh, well, uh, my name is Canyon Coyote Woman Sarah's Roots. That's Canyon with a K. My website is canyonconsulting.com. Both of those are with K's. So I'm hashtag KKLLC. And I have many social media sites of which once you get a chance to email me on Canyon Consulting or my uh, social media accounts, Canyon LLC on Facebook and Canyon Consulting on Instagram. Um, shoot me a message and I can give you access possibly to my more personal accounts because I do have my own personal YouTube that is Coyote Rants and Rambles, which is always fun. And I intend on creating more for Coyote, uh, for uh, Canyon Consulting as a more professional basis. So connect on there. Um, wouldn't mind consultation gigs. I love support and solidarity. So any contributions is helpful. And I love collaborations. If anyone is into off the grid sustainable living systems, if anyone is into consultation, that'll change the world. If anyone is into creating a network of reliable resources where people can support each other versus outsourcing, I'm all about it. And I would love to learn more about who's, who's all about it too. Thank you for sharing your time with us on Next Economy Now and so grateful for the work you're doing in the, in the world and um, looking forward to seeing you at, at some upcoming events and, and continuing to stay in collaboration with you. Next Economy Now is a production of Lyft Economy. To listen to all of our episodes, go to lifteconomy.com slash podcast. That's L I F T economy.com slash podcast. You can also sign up for our monthly newsletter at lifteconomy.com slash newsletter. Please also rate and review our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening.